transfer from animal cells that uh, many of you are probably more familiar with. And then we'll spend most of our time really thinking about how plant cell expansion, what drives plant cell expansion, and how this relates to shape determination, how plant cells get shaped, so morphogenesis. Uh, and there we'll see the connection between the cytoskeleton and uh, the cell wall uh, formation machinery. And then I'll wrap up with just a, a little bit, a very brief discussion of some of the current ideas, um, really findings more than ideas uh, that people are now beginning to sort of explore in terms of how mechanical forces uh, affect the cytoskeleton and the cell wall machinery and therefore uh, morphogenesis of cells and cellular function. Okay, so this is sort of the generic pictures that you'd see in textbooks you know, of a plant cell on the, on the left here. Do you guys see the mouse that I'm, I'm moving around here as a pointer? Yes? Okay, so the plant cell on the left, uh, uh, sort of a generic kind of animal cell on the right. And plant cells, of course, one of the distinguishing features is their primary producer, so they can fix carbon, take carbon dioxide and fix it to make uh, simple carbohydrates. And this, of course, takes place in the chloroplast, uh, which are the chlorophyll containing organelles and via the process of photosynthesis. The vast majority of this fixed carbon uh, gets locked up as polysaccharides that make up the cell wall. So you can think of the cell wall, the plant cell wall, as one of the major sinks for the fixed carbon. All right. So of course, the fixed carbon is also being used to make proteins and lipids and other things that are part of the cell are important for cell function uh, and life uh, of the cell. But a lot of it, a, a huge chunk of it gets um, uh, uh, shunted to synthesize polysaccharides that will be delivered out of the cell to form the cell wall. And as the cell wall, as we will see, is a rigid structure, and unlike the animal extracellular matrix, the plant cell wall, at least in land plants, is polysaccharide rich. It's 95% polysaccharide, about 5% or so protein. Um, and because we have this cellulose rich rigid cell wall, which acts as sort of an exoskeleton, this prevents any motility. So you don't see cell motility uh, in land plants. Um, some other distinguishing features are uh, mature plant cells tend to have, many of them tend to have a large central vacuole. Um, and this can occupy the bulk of the volume in, in mature cells. And as you will see shortly, the vacuole, uh, you know, is, is uh, the recycling or degradation compartment similar to the lysosome in animal cells, uh, but also is where a lot of the water and solutes are, are stored, and this generates hydrostatic pressure or turgor pressure, which is really important to the life of a plant cell. Uh, another consequence of having a large vacuole occupy the bulk of the cellular, intracellular space is that the cytoplasm it gets pushed to the edges. And so in many mature cells that have very large vacuoles, you just have a thin sliver of cytoplasm at the cortex and sort of, and sometimes that's kind of strands, cytoplasmic strands between vacuoles. And I'll show you a couple of movies and, and this will become a little bit more clear. Um, the Golgi apparatus in, in uh, land plants is dispersed. There is no central Golgi, sort of as you see on the right here in animal cells, you know, there's a centralized Golgi body typically near the nucleus or the centrosome. In plants, the Golgi body, you can't really quite see it very well in this picture here, is there are hundreds of Golgi bodies kind of all dispersed and moving around in the cytoplasm. And I like to think of the plant Golgi as not only important for trafficking of proteins and delivery of proteins to various compartments, as uh, is the case in, in animal cells, but also they are major factories for cell wall component synthesis and trafficking, right? So a lot of cell wall components are synthesized in the Golgi as you'll see later on in the lecture and must be uh, packaged and delivered for secretion. Um, so that's another one of the major tasks of the plant Golgi bodies. Uh, some other interesting features are plants lack centrosomes. And this organelle here on the right uh, consisting of centrioles and is the major microtubule nucleation center. Uh, 
Um, there are no centrosomes in plants, and there's also no dynein in plants. So the microtubule arrays, as you will see in the images and in the movies, are linearly organized and not radially organized as you see in this animal cell here. Everybody okay so far? Any questions? So then how do microtubules nucleate? So microtubules are nucleated by the same protein complex, the gamma tubulin nuclei, you know, the complex. Uh, it, it's the difference is that this gamma tubulin ring complexes are not clustered and concentrated at the centrosome. They are rather dispersed. So the, the basic mechanism for nucleation of microtubules, i.e. requiring a gamma tubulin ring complex, is the, is the same in plants and animals. How the gamma tubulin ring complex is spatially organized is different. Does that make sense? Yep. Thank you. Yep. OK, so while I've so far you know, said that plant cells are, because of the cell wall, not really motile and therefore pretty static and, and don't look like they're doing much, interestingly, the inside of the plant cells is extremely dynamic. So you guys have probably all seen these kinds of movies of cytoplasmic streaming. You're seeing chloroplasts here you know, moving around in this cytoplasmic stream. Um, as well as, of course, mitosis, um, which because of the no centrosome, you can see the spindle here is pretty barrel shaped and cytokinesis occurs centrifugally and there's no pinching mechanism, rather there's a new cell plate or cell wall deposition that's occurring. And we'll see a little bit more of this uh, later on. Here, I just want to emphasize that you know, don't think of plant cells as sort of not really doing anything, the insides are extremely dynamic. In fact, plants contain the most number of kinesins, more kinesins present in, in a Arabidopsis than in our bodies, for example, and in most plant plants, even mosses. Uh, and so they do rely on dynamic mechanisms to adjust and adapt to their changing environment. And so just to kind of lay the stage, uh, and I think Lucia Strader, who will talk about plant development later on, I think on Thursday, uh, we'll, we'll uh, expand more on this um, just as a sort of teaser for how to think about how you know, cells in multicellular organisms like plants and animals, how the morphogenetic mechanisms differ. So in our bodies, we have hundreds of different cell types, right? each specialized for different functions, having different shapes, and cell migration as well as programmed cell death or apoptosis is really, really important um, for uh, forming our body plan and, and the shapes of organs. In plants, it's a simpler situation. There's really about 30 or 40 different cell types, depending on which plant you're looking at. Um, and of course, there's really no cell migration. There is programmed cell death. Typically, it is not involved in morphogenesis. So an example of programmed cell death is cells that make up the water conducting tissues or the xylem in plants. Those cells at maturity undergo program cell death or apoptosis, and then those empty shells, those cell wall tubes really, then serve as water conducting tubes. But that doesn't affect the shape of the plant. So apoptosis is not really that important as far as morphogenesis is concerned. So we can then think of the, the, our shape, the animal shape, as a history of where and when cell division occurred, where cells moved, and which cells died. Whereas in plants, the shape is really a history of cell division, and as you will see, largely of cell expansion, and particularly there, the direction of cell expansion and the extent or degree of cell expansion. Right? So one nice way of keeping this in mind is, is animals respond behaviorally, right? So when uh, we wanna, uh, if it's too hot, we move ourselves and get in the shade, or something like that, plants don't have that option, so they respond developmentally, uh, and as well as biochemically, by producing molecules that effectively serve as sunscreens, et cetera. Um, so very different sort of strategies in, in these two types of organisms. Um, so now I'm gonna spend most of the time thinking about plant cell expansion, because um, this is really one of the determining factors of uh, overall tissue, as well as organ shape, in plants, and there are two kinds of cell expansions or cell growth um, that we can describe. One is called diffuse growth, and here 
what I've depicted on the on the, in this cell that's sort of like a square on the extreme left here, the little black dots are imagine some sort of fiduciary marker, you know, uh, carbon particles or something, let's say that we've sprinkled on the, the cell surface. And diffuse growth is when the cell is expanding at relatively the same rate throughout the cell. So that if we started out with this situation, as a consequence of diffuse growth, you see that these dots uh, are now evenly spaced all along. They have their spacing between them has increased due to growth, but it has increased the same along the length of the cell, right? And this is really important for, this is really what underlies the uh, elongation of roots or the elongation of shoots, the expansion of leaves. A lot of it is, uh, uh, the bulk of it is, is dependent on diffuse growth. And I've shown you some examples of cell types and tissue types here. We don't have to worry about the technical names for today's lecture, but these are all um, cells and, and tissues undergoing diffuse growth to generate the plant body. As opposed to diffuse growth, we also have tip growth, and this is uh, occurring in, in our bodies as well. You know, gr uh, growth cones, nerve cells, for example, are extending by tip growth. And here the situation is different rather than the growth being distributed roughly evenly uh, across the cell, the growth is focused to a particular location or tip, hence tip growth. So you can see here, again, if we have uh, a cell marked with these black dots, the growth is focused only on this right end tip, right? So the extension or growth has happened only there, whereas uh, at the shank, there has, there's no growth. And this is achieved by focusing the delivery of material that is, you know, membranes and new cell wall material, et cetera, to just this end or tip of the cell. And so it's growing in that very polarized manner. And this is very important for pollen tubes. And as you guys have no doubt heard by now, one of your group projects is about pollen tubes. And so I'll spend, you, uh, spend a little bit of time just introducing uh, pollen tubes a little bit later on in today's lecture. Another place where tip growth is really important in plants is root hairs. These single cell projections, uh, these projections that are projecting from single cells on the surface of roots that increase the surface area for absorption of minerals. Right? And pollen tubes, as we'll see, are, are the delivery tubes for the sperm cells so that you can have fertilization and the formation of a zygote. So um, let's think a little bit more about diffuse growth. So as you've seen in my pictures here, right, the diffuse growth is happening still in, in a directional manner. This cell is extending you know, sideways, not vertically, for example, or it's not just ballooning to be sort of roughly spherical. There is a directionality, and of course that's important so that the root grows in a directional manner uh, or the shoot grows in a directional manner. Uh, and how this directionality is achieved is very different, again, between animals and plants. So our cells are soft, compliant, squishy, relatively compared to plant cells. And here, you know, is a classic picture from um, Switkina's lab at Penn, uh, uh, you know, looking at uh, keratocytes, so you, fibroblasts, many crawling cells have sort of similar sorts of architectures where you have a dense actin cytoskeleton consisting of sort of branched actin uh, filaments uh, pushing on the plasma membrane at this end, the top end, so the cell is then the pla that extends the plasma membrane. Then there's also adhesion that's involved where the cell has to adhere to the substrate. And this sort of cycle of pushing, extending the plasma membrane forward, stapling it down to the surface, retracting the back end are the basic processes that underlie how this cell moves. In this case, it would be moving in this direction, right from the top uh, uh, to, toward the top. These kinds of cytoskeleton derived forces um, are pale in comparison to turgor pressure. And so the way cell shaping occurs in plants is not, I emphasize that, not because of forces that are directly exerted by the cytoskeleton, unlike in, in the situation of animal cells. So turgor pressure or hydrostatic pressure is really large in, in growing plant cells. So in growing plant cells, this is in the typical ranges are in this kind of 0.6 to 2 megapascals, and uh, sorry, that P is a typo, that should be a capital P. Um, 
And just to give you a sense of what that what, what that might feel like, that's three to ten times the tire pressure in our cars. So it's a lot of 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 pressure that's is being generated in these cells, and this is because of accumulation of solutes and and um, uh, minerals in the vacuole, which uh, pulls water osmotically, and and then you generate this hydrostatic pressure, right? And again, as a comparison, our blood pressure, even high blood pressure, is kind of 0 0.003 or so megapascals, so very very high turgor pressures, and this is the driving force for the growth of plant cells. So this turgor pressure is positive pressure pushing outward on the on the on the cell uh, and on the wall and uh, since on its own hydrostatic pressure does not have inherent directionality uh, you would expect that the plant cell would just balloon right so you'd have this hydrostatic pressure kind of pushing uniformly in all directions and the cell would just kind of swell up like a balloon you know where you're pumping in more and more air but this is Sometimes this happens. In many cases, uh, cells do not expand isotropically, but rather they expand anisotropically. And this is achieved by patterning the cell wall material. So if the cellulose, which is the major load bearing structure, so cellulose microfibrils, which are these cable like structures, which are the ma major element of the cell wall, by weight, their tensile strength is higher than steel, so they're very strong. If you, if the cells orient the bulk of the cellulose microfibrils in this direction, as I've shown here with, in these, with these black lines, then that would constrain expansion in, in the, along that direction. And so now the cell is essentially in a way forced to expand in the orthogonal axis. So now this creates the material or mechanical anisotropy in the wall whose consequence is to lead to this polarized or, or oriented rather uh, uh, expansion. So you now have anisotropic cell expansion. And we'll spend a few more slides thinking about how plants do this. How do they pattern their cell wall material? And, and as you'll see, this is where the uh, cytoskeleton will be really important. But before, I wanted to emphasize this point of turgor pressure as being sort of an integral aspect of how plants grow and how they interact with the environment, how they deal with, you know, everything that happens to them during their life cycle. Um, so turgor pressure, as I just described to you, is really important for cell growth and elongation. And this is responsible for the bulk of organ elongation, like the root. So the stem cell population in the roots are just a couple of cells here called the quiescent center. These cells are dividing, giving rise to new cells. And then these new cells, as you'll probably hear a lot more from Lucia Strader's talk, uh, respond to plant hormones, et cetera, and start expanding or elongating. And their final size or length volume can be 100 or 1,000 times more than their initial um, size, right? And so this is what's really getting that root to grow long um, and, and grow into the soil or conversely the shoot. Um, another very uh, important uh, process that takes place that also require, uh, relies on turgor pressure is the opening and closing of holes on the surface of leaves and stems that are called stomata. So these are really just literally holes uh, that, and this, the stomatal pore or hole is surrounded by these two kidney bean shape, shaped cells called guard cells. And it's the expansion of uh, sort of the shape change of the guard cells driven by turgor pressure that controls is the stomatal pore open and therefore enabling gas exchange, so uptake of oxygen or carbon dioxide, uh, as well as water loss. So plants wilt because water is, is being, uh, uh, is transpired or evaporated uh, from the surface of leaves through these uh, stomatal pores. But plants can close these pores to prevent water loss under, uh, under conditions of drought stress, for example. Um, and this is all mediated. We don't have to worry about the details. I just showed it down here just so you can appreciate that this is all involving ion fluxes to create osmotic gradients uh, uh, as so that water flows in. And in this case, the cell is turgid and that open leads to this kind of a shape of the guard cells opening the pore. And when the cell becomes flaccid, the stomatal pore is, is closed. Right, so really central process for
uh, uh, key, you know, this is important for photosynthesis, which relies on gas, uh, carbon dioxide uptake. And as I described, important for making sure that plants don't completely dehydrate. So getting back now to the question of cell wall and isotropy, right? So just as a reminder here, we're now talking about this process. Why doesn't the plant cell just balloon and become you know, a large sphere? Uh, instead, many cells have defined shapes. So that relies on cell wall patterning and the mechanism for that is very uh, intimately connected with the microtubule cytoskeleton. So this is one of my favorite pictures one of the very first pictures of microtubules ever taken by Keith Porter's lab in the 60s. What we're looking at is sort of an oblique section through a plant cell uh, and visualized by electron microscopy. This little sort of amorphous chunk is a piece of the cell wall. You can maybe appreciate some fibrous nature to that and that's uh, the cellulose fibers which are oriented in this kind of 11 o'clock direction and subtending the cell wall beneath the plasma membrane, you see these tube-like structures, and hence they were named microtubules because of this appearance. And you can appreciate very easily that the orientation of the microtubules matches the orientation of the cellulose microfibrils. And this observation and other uh, experiments using drug uh, pharmacological treatments led to this idea very early on in the 60s that the way to that the microtubule cytoskeleton might serve as a scaffolding structure to guide the oriented assembly of the cell wall, right? And so this idea is still is uh, uh, has so far um, held true a lot of uh, work over the years, uh, including more recent uh, live observation of uh, of the enzymes that synthesize the cell wall have shown that these. Uh, indeed do move along microtubules in the direction that the microtubules are oriented, resulting in this anisotropy in the cell wall, uh, because now you have oriented the cellulose in this direction rather than being randomly uh, organized. And in fact, if you disrupt the organization of the cortical microtubules, you can do this either genetically by mutants that affect microtubule organization or by using pharmacological agents that, for example, depolymerize microtubules, then you can actually cause the cells to expand more isotropically. And in some cases, essentially completely isotropically. Okay. So organization of the microtubule cytoskeleton is really important for this anisotropic expansion. The cortical microtubule cytoskeleton, this scaffolding structure is very dynamic. Uh, here's a movie from my lab. We're looking at GFP labeled tubulin and R e uh, M cherry labeled uh, EB1. This is a plus N tracking protein, so it enables us to look at the tips to visualize the growing tips of microtubules. And you can see that this cytoskeleton is very dynamic, right? And this is um, the new microtubules constantly uh, nucleated in this system. But you can also appreciate that even over these, you know, several minutes the overall orientation, the net orientation of the microtubules is preserved in this sort of vertical direction, right? And so plants have mechanisms that I don't have the time to describe today, but that's a lot of what my lab um, studies is how do plants order their microtubule cytoskeleton as well as reorder the microtubule cytoskeleton when the plant cell must change its growth axis in response to environmental stimuli such as light, for example, or developmental stimuli such as hormones. And so that's really kind of the, uh, the summarized here. Uh, since the cortical microtubule cytoskeleton is serving as a morphogenetic engine, you'd expect that it, they would adopt the microtubule cytoskeleton would have different architectures and different cell types, as you can see here in this cell, as opposed to this kind of radial patterns in the guard cells that we just talked about, or more sort of complex uh, net-like organizations in other cell types. And these microtubule arrays can also reorient, in some cases in a wholesale manner, as you can see in these cells here, they are in this transverse direction when the cells are rapidly growing. And when these cells mature and stop elongating, the entire cytoskeleton is reordered into this sort of longitudinal uh, or sometimes kind of oblique uh, orientation. And this can go back and forth depending on, on the cell's uh, 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 decision to grow or not. 
So one last point I want to make before we switch to a um, uh, tip growth is uh, to remind you that you know these cortical microtubules that are present beneath the plasma membrane, they're also pre they're present uh, in a way that they are attached along the lengths to the plasma membrane. So you can see they really form this kind of scaffolding structure on the inside of the cell. We're guiding the delivery of cell wall material such as this cellulose so that the cellulose is oriented in a similar manner as the microtubules and the cellulose then constrains expansion in a directional manner. And because of this, uh, the way this is working, uh, really I, I uh, or you know, in the field now, um, I've been urging people to think about the plant cytoskeleton not as a cytos as a skeleton, uh, i.e. a supporting structure or as, or as a structure that actually directly determines shape as in animal cells, for example, as I described earlier, but more as a scaffolding structure, which is guiding cell wall deposition. So it's sort of more of an organizing framework, which is the way, for example, the spindle apparatus works, right? Most other microtubule arrays like the spindle apparatus is, is simply spatially organizing biochemical processes so that, for example, in the spindle, chromosome segregation can take place properly. And here, this cortical microtubule is serving as an organizing framework to pattern cell wall deposition. So very different way of thinking about this kind of skeleton idea. All right, any questions so far? Okay, um, just a, a one slide to remind you guys that the microtubule cytoskeleton is not just dynamic sort of over, you know, at any given time of the cell cycle, like an interface that we've been looking at so far with these cortical microtubule arrays responsible for specifying growth axis. But of course, as in other cells, these microtubule arrays uh, undergo dramatic reorganizations during cell division. Um, and in plants, one of the unique structures is this band of microtubules called the preprophase band that accurately defines the, the cell division site this, I know that is going to be uh, laid down later in cytokinesis. The spindle apparatus is still involved in chromosome segregation as is in other eukaryotic cells. And the cytokinetic apparatus in plant cells is not an actin myosin based, uh, you know, sort of purse ring, a pinching mechanism, but rather a microtubule based structure called the phragmoplast. It starts out as a disc in the center between the two daughter nuclei and expands outward. Uh, and its job is to guide the deposition of cell wall material that will form a, a new cell plate or cell wall that will physically divide these two daughter cells. Okay. And if you guys are interested in more, you can look this up or I'm happy to, to talk more about this uh, when I'm there at the retreat. Uh, you guys can also bug Ryan and, and Graham uh, about this. So in terms of orientation of the plant cell division plane, all I want to say, I'm not going to go into, we don't have time to think about mechanistic uh, uh, um, sort of understanding, but I want to make this point that the orientation of the division plane is very important, again, uh, in terms of creating, uh, uh, you know, tissues and organs in plants, as well as, for example, uh, in animals, for that matter. So we, uh, the technical names are not important. If the division is parallel to the surface of the the root, for example, here called periclinal division, then what this is leading to is creating new cell layers or it's increasing the width of this organ. So you go from one cell layer to now two cell layers if you divide in this orientation, but if you divide in the opposite orientation or the orthogonal orientation rather, what's called anticlinal, then what that works uh, to do is to add more cells to this cell layer. So you're increasing the surface area of that cell layer. And patterned or programmed, uh, you know, cycles of this periclinal versus anticlinal division are very important in creating new cell layers. Uh, as you can see here, you know, you go from uh, two cell layers to then now you can expand the cell layer in this dark purple uh, by anticlinal cell divisions. And similarly, to grow a new lateral root that will protrude out of an existing main root also involves these kind of uh, cycles of periclinal or anticlinal cell division followed by uh, you know, periclinal and anticlinal together. So you can imagine how controlling and specifying cell division plane by orienting the preprophase band is really important uh, 
for creating new organs or expanding existing organs. All right, so moving on very quickly to tip growth. So far, we've really thought about diffuse growth um, that's involved in creating the bulk of the plant body. Tip growth, the two primary model systems and really the two main locations where this is happening is pollen tubes and root hairs, as I showed you earlier. And the pollen tube is, is a very popular model for studying tip growth. And unlike diffuse growth, where the microtubule cytoskeleton dominates, I want to emphasize the actin cytoskeleton is also involved in diffuse growth by making sure the Golgi bodies and uh, other organelles are distributed properly. But the microtubule cytoskeleton is the major player because that's what serves as the scaffolding structure for patterning cell wall. Unlike the diffuse growth situation, tip growth, the major cytoskeletal uh, uh, machinery involves the actin cytoskeleton. If you depolymerize the microtubule cytoskeleton, uh, you don't really have a major effect on tip growth. Uh, the polarity is a little bit altered and my, things might be a little slower, but tip growth still occurs just fine. But if you destroy the actin cytoskeleton, you really completely stop tip growth. And you can see the actin cytoskeleton staining in a pollen here, a pollen tube. Uh, you have these long cable-like structures and some fringe uh, structures here. We don't have to worry about the details. And the job of these actin uh, filaments is to uh, 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 orient the delivery of vesicles. You can see how densely, uh, how dense they are at this tip. And these vesicles are, of course, delivering the components, you know, the new membrane components, the new wall components, so that this tip extends, uh, resulting in this tip growth and this very polarized growth. Um, so since one of your projects involves pollen tubes, uh, just a little bit of information to help you guys with that. So pollen grains, you can really think of as the sperm packets of plants. So these pollen grains consist of a few cells, about three or so cells, uh, they, the key cells really are sort of the sperm cells that, uh, and so when a pollen grain lands on the female part of the flower called the stigma, and, in, and what that looks like differs from different plants. In some cells, the stigma has these long finger-like uh, projections which receive the pollen. Then the pollen will germinate by drawing water from uh, the, the female tissue and produce this pollen tube that you can see here. And these pollen tubes penetrate and grow within the female tissue, sometimes over considerable distances. So in maize, hopefully all of you guys have seen the silk, the long, hairy uh, stuff that comes out from the tip of the maize flower or the, uh, the corn on the cob when you buy it. Uh, the, that's the female, the receptive part on which pollen lands. And so the pollen tube must grow through that entire silk length, go and then fertilize the eggs to make the corn kernels, right? Those are the seeds uh, that are the result of fertilization. And so in May, is pollen tubes grow pretty fast, 2.8, you know, basically three microns per second. But even many, in many other species as well, these are some of the fastest growing cells in plants, you know, growing in the order of 0.2 to 0.3 microns per second. So you can really observe this in real time using bright field microscopy. And the job of the pollen tube is to grow all the way through the female part of the plant, reach the ovule where the two uh, sperm cells will be released. And so they can fertilize the egg to form the seed. And here on the right-hand side is a, what this looks like in real life. Uh, on the left here is also a a uh, SEM image of real pollen grains uh, germinating on a pistil. But here you see the pollen grains have germinated. These pollen tubes they have grown all the way into the ovary. And you can maybe see these little ghost-like oval structures. Those are the ovules, these structures within which there are eggs. And so these pollen tubes will grow in a directional and guided manner. They must grow through the female tissue and also, of course, find the ovules to deliver the sperm cells. So. Uh, this is what we want you guys to think about in one of the projects is how might mechanical forces that the plant pollen tubes experience uh, be important for this process. Uh, one last point before we move to cell walls is cytoplasmic streaming again. This is powered by myosins. And so here you can see 
you know, this empty space is the vacuole. You can see the cytoplasmic strands, and there's also cytoplasm at the very edge of the cell at the cortex. And you can see organelles kind of zipping around. Uh, and this is all powered by myosins called myosin 11s. And these are some of the fastest known motors, plant myosin 11s. And in some of these giant alga like Cara, these myosins move at blistering paces of close to 100 microns per second. Um, so there's a, a lot of interesting mechanobiology from this sort of single molecule or molecular perspective. Um, I want to spend the last maybe, how long do I have till about 10? Okay, so I'm actually officially out of time. How are we dealing with this? <laughs> you can go ahead, Ron. We'll just... Uh, we'll okay, I'm going to just wrap this up very quickly. I don't need to go over detail. So... Just thinking about cell wall, the cell wall, as you have appreciated so far, is really important for plant physiology, but also has been essential for human civilization from its very beginning. You know, paper, fiber, food, wood, fuel, in terms of biofuel, even all of this is cell wall dependent. And the cell wall, as I've emphasized, I'm not going to read through these slides now. This is sort of mainly uh, for reference so that you guys can go back and, and use these slides as reference. Uh, and if you guys want to have access to them, I'm happy to mail a PDF version that, and maybe I'll do that and mail it to you, Jim, so that you can send it out to the students. Um, so the cell wall, as you've seen, is really acting as the exoskeleton, providing rigidity and allowing turgor pressure to build up and, and providing the mechanical strength so that plants can grow, you know, hundreds of meters in, in, uh, in length without buckling or collapsing under their own weight. Um, there are two major cell wall types. One is called the primary cell wall. This is basically what all cells, when they're growing, are surrounded by. These cell walls are relatively thin and they are compliant. They're flexible enough to grow, right? So that the cell can expand. When cells mature, they lay down additional layers of cell wall um, and to form what's called a secondary cell wall. So these cell walls are much thicker, three to four times as thick. And in addition, they get lignified. There are a lot of other uh, modifications that occur to further strengthen this. And this is really what wood is, right? So this is the job of the secondary cell walls is to provide the mechanical strength to hold the plant body upright uh, and withstand gravity. Um, the cell wall consists, as I've already said, primarily of polysaccharides, cellulose. And again, you guys can read through the details. I wasn't intending to do this during my lecture anyway. This is just as a reference. So cellulose form these, you know, are made one of the most abundant biopolymer. In fact, many of these are some of the most abundant biopolymers on earth. So cellulose forms linear polymers. Then there are very complex kind of branched polymers as I'll show you on the next slide called hemicelluloses and pectins that together form sort of the matrix within which the cellulose exists in. The secondary cell walls have these aromatic polyphenolic compounds called lignin that waterproofs them and also strengthens them. And although proteins by mass are a minor component, of course, they are very important. They're, they play structural roles as well as very important enzymatic roles that enable wall assembly as well as wall expansion. And so this is, and, and lipids in certain cells are, are also important by kind of forming a waxy layer. So here is just a snapshot of you know, some of these components. So you can see cellulose are linear polymers that crystallize actually to form cellulose cables, whereas hemicelluloses, like the one shown here on the upper right, and pectins in the lower left here, have a very complex branch structure that involves different kinds of sugars, unlike cellulose, which is just glucose, uh, linearly polymerized. And lignin is very complicated polyphenolic involves enzymes that have to form these cross links between them. So the cell wall is very complex composite material and its composition um, and organization and therefore also its mechanics is changing dynamically. So it is not a dead material. Wood looks dead to us, but in living plants, its composition and, and, and behavior is being modulated over growth and development to serve various uh, uh, functions uh, uh, required by the cell. Cell wall material, uh, obviously you, can, you saw that there are many things that go into producing the cell wall. Incidentally, there are some analogies, right, that we can make to the animal's extracellular matrix. In both cases, we have long uh, 
roughly linear or branched polymers that are, have repetitive motifs that can in, interact with each other. The same kind of scenario is happening in the animal extracellular matrix with collagen and fibronectin and fibrolin, et cetera, et cetera, interacting with each other to form sort of networks. Um, cell wall synthesis is occurring at multiple locations. The Golgi apparatus, as I already mentioned, is a major cell wall factory. The hemicellulosis and the pectins are all synthesized in the Golgi and must be secreted. The cellulose is synthesized by a very large enzyme complex called the cellulose synthase complex, which is delivered to the plasma membrane. And then the cellulose synthase complex takes sucrose from photosynthesis and converts it to glucose and polymerizes it to form cellulose that is directly extruded out into the cell wall space. So you have these cellulose microfibrils that consist of anywhere between 24 to 36 cellulose uh, fibers kind of uh, crystallized together to form these very strong cellulose cables. And so an important job that cells must do is to coordinate the deposition of all of these different materials so that the wall has the appropriate composition and therefore mechanical properties. Expansion of the cell involves breaking or uh, some of these linkages between the cell uh, that exist between the cell wall components so that they can slip, allowing for new material to be deposited and for the cell growth to occur. And this is where proteins, enzymes are very important that do many of these jobs of remodeling the cell wall material. And then I wanna just really wrap up with two slides kind of getting you to think about how mechanical forces play a role uh, in, in changing these uh, cytoskeletal and cell wall systems. Just again, to start out with, remember that cell wall, plant cells are literally stuck together by their, uh, through their cell walls. They're not moving with respect to each other, but these cells are building up large turgor pressures. So these cells are all sort of pushing on each other uh, and cells can sense this. And recent experiments have shown using, for example, laser ablation, as you can see on the top here, the red patch here are dead cells that were killed by laser ablation, by focusing lasers to kill those cells. And before ablating those cells, you can see the microtubule cytoskeleton in this kind of green fibrous uh, signal here has a particular orientation. When you kill uh, cells, then you see that the micro, the, as a result, the mechanical forces generated due to turgor pressure change and the microtubule cytoskeleton reorients along the axis of maximal uh, force. There are also other responses occurring. There are proteins that transport key plant hormones called auxin, whose or, or, uh, 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 localization changes in response to altering mechanical forces. Uh, another easy way to see this is just simply lacerating leaves. So here we have a leaf surface. The, microtubules in these particular jigsaw puzzle piece uh, shaped cells are usually sort of um, net-like. Uh, here, what they have done is just basically pinch away a chunk of the leaf. And after about three hours, you can see these microtubules have reoriented parallel to that cut surface. And you can prevent these kinds of responses by uh, if you have mutations in, in particular microtubule uh, binding proteins that are important for these reorganizations. And so some of the key questions that are really important from the center's perspective is thinking about how do plant cells sense mechanical forces? And how is this information transduced? What kind of mechanotransduction is occurring so that the plant cell can then respond, you know, be it by changing the microtubule organization or, or, or many other kinds of responses. And how does this in turn help the plant to adapt by affecting its, its growth? And I'll end there. Um, and if, if we have any qu burning questions, maybe we can spend a couple of minutes on that. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Ron, can I ask one? Yeah. It's Becky. Um, do you think it would be useful to think about um, an animal cell is basically the cell itself is like a central vacuole and it's in matrix, which is serving a similar function to the cell wall. 
I mean, it struck me that, that they were very parallel situations, but I don't know if it's useful to try to make that analogy at all. Yeah, I'm not sure I would make the analogy of the vacuole because the vacuole's job in the plant cell is really just sort of, you know, A as a garbage compartment and B as a turgor generating 